Uh, this one just looks straight into the camera lens. And actually, if we can have you call it. You know, I, should I put that cat away? <laughs> Invisible forces shape the world around us. Rules, regulations, and decisions made behind closed doors to determine what we drive, what we take when we're sick, and how we build our future. The proper place these regulations should take has increasingly become the subject of fierce public debate. The underlying question is, are we stifling the innovators whose ideas offer us cutting edge solutions to some of society's oldest problems? Or are we protecting ourselves from unpredictable outcomes? I'm Adam Thier. And in this three-part series, we're peeling back the layers to reveal the hidden boundaries shaping the things you use every day. From the cars on the road, to life-saving medicine, to the cutting edge of AI. We'll explore the tension between innovation and control, safety and freedom. Who gets to decide what shapes our world and how will it impact you? What you drive, how it's made, even what it costs. It's not just about engineering, it's about rules, trade-offs, and the quiet power of regulation. Cars are integral to American culture. They symbolize freedom, progress, and personal identity. They've shaped our cities, influenced our economy, and they're a huge part of our daily lives. American car manufacturers have long been a part of the backbone of our economy, with American engineering expertise often setting the standard worldwide. But what many people don't realize is that a lot of what automakers produce, how they produce it, and even the quality of the cars themselves is not a result of business decisions alone. Instead, much of it is shaped by behind the scenes regulations that most Americans have little knowledge of. Take the corporate average fuel economy or cafe standards, for example. These federal regulations were introduced during the 1970s energy crisis to improve fuel efficiency and reduce reliance on foreign oil. While these goals make sense and have led to cleaner, more fuel efficient vehicles, many people argue that the way the rules are structured often ignores market realities, stifles innovation, and creates unintended challenges for automakers. So tell us what you know about like how cafe standards have shaped markets and shaped cars uh, over time. You know, the government has a legitimate interest in safety standards, but they have gone so far beyond that that they are uh, limiting the design features of manufacturers and limit, limiting the choices uh, of consumers. Safety, I think some of the improvements in efficiency, um, better gas mileage, less pollution, you know, I think those are all great things. They've kind of come at the cost of how are we going to market this? You know, is do people like this? And I get it that sometimes you have to do things with engineering changes that don't always make an easy sell. But where do cafe standards originally come from? Like many American regulations, they're rooted in a crisis. In this case, the infamous oil shortages and subsequent concerns about energy independence of the 1970s. The oil producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. People can no longer afford to run cars that do 12 miles to the gallon. The monsters are dying of thirst. The energy crisis is killing them. Michael Bushbacher is a partner at the Boyden Gray Law Firm in Washington, D.C., where he focuses on challenging possible regulatory overreach, especially in energy and environmental policy. 1973, you've got the Arab uh, oil embargo, and that's where you get those famous pictures of people waiting in line for gasoline at the gas station. It was really, really detrimental and really scary because we saw that our dependence on foreign oil made us vulnerable to policy manipulation or control from our foreign adversaries. The response to that was the CAFE program and the Energy Policy and Conservation Act in 1975. Stephen Bradbury served as general counsel to the U.S. Department of Transportation from November 2017 until January 2021, where he oversaw all of the department's rulemaking and enforcement actions. He was also sworn in as Deputy Secretary of Transportation on March 13, 2025. Congress passed a comprehensive statute designed to achieve energy conservation so that the U.S. would be less dependent 
on foreign sources of oil. And so it addressed energy standards and requirements generally, but one of the things it created was the CAFE program. And for the first time, it mandated that a federal agency would set minimum thresholds for fuel economy for new model vehicles. If you want to get less of something, the easiest way to do it is you tax it. But it wasn't a tax. Why not? Well, taxes are not popular. And gasoline is one of the things that people really know the price of. They see the price five, six times a day on a sign driving into work. You know, no one knows the price per kilowatt hour of electricity, but everyone knows more or less the price of gasoline. And so putting a tax on that and jacking up that price was something that was politically unpalatable. So instead of doing that, they decided to hide the cost in new vehicle costs. You had to meet these average fuel economy standards across your fleet. Congress set the first several years of those standards, and they were pretty aggressive. Daniel Sperling is the founding director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis and is a leading expert on transportation policy. The CAFE standards were very disruptive. You have to think about this. 13, 14 miles per gallon was the average for our cars and light trucks at that time. And requirement was that it get up to 27.5, a doubling by 1985. Over the years, full-size Ford pickups have been winning the uphill battle for better gas mileage, and each breakthrough has been tough. Ford's full-size pickup broke through the 18 MPG barrier in 1979. In 1981, it got a 21. And last year, Ford broke through 22 MPG. This year... The CAFE program, along with EPCA, established the first nationwide fuel economy standards. And by 1985, automakers had achieved a target of 27.5 miles per gallon for cars, primarily due to the emphasis on smaller vehicles and the switch away from iron and steel construction towards lighter materials like aluminum and plastic. After this, fuel economy progress slowed down throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, leading automakers to explore alternative ways to meet the regulation's technical requirements. In addition to this, climate change began to be a bigger and bigger concern for the public and lawmakers alike, which spurred the federal government to expand the program's goals and scope. If EPA is going to set carbon dioxide emission limits for new vehicles, that is exactly what the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration does when it sets fuel economy standards. As a practical matter, though, unfortunately, in the Obama administration, they actually gave the keys to this new regulatory engine to the EPA. It gets really complicated to take CAFE standards, which are purely a petroleum-based requirement, and take into account these other fuels. So the EPA standards are probably now much more relevant and actually tend to be more observed by the industry and more binding. But these two sets of standards are supposed to be in parallel. And it is an example of, frankly, government dysfunction. As time goes by, market dynamics shift and regulations evolve and both vehicle manufacturing and consumer behavior have been influenced in ways that no one fully anticipated. These changes raise important questions. Have the regulations truly achieved their goals? What trade-offs come along with them? You know, when people wonder, for example, why are so many people driving SUVs? Well, that's because if a car is classified as a truck, then the regulations aren't as tight. Originally, CAFE standards required automakers to meet a uniform average fuel economy across their fleet, encouraging smaller, more efficient vehicles. But by the late 2000s, regulators began to rethink how to enforce these standards. Nissan, later joined by the EPA, spearheaded a new approach, something that they called footprint-based standards. This adjustment reshaped the entire automotive market. It used to be every car company had one requirement, and you could make big cars, little cars, and average it all out. Well, come around 2010, they wanted to up these standards in the U.S. car industry, which tended to make big vehicles. So they made a deal with them that the standards would be redesigned to be what we call footprint-based standards. So the footprint was the space between the four wheels. And what that meant is, if you had a bigger vehicle, you had a less stringent standard. So the car companies gamed the standards. They said, if we have a less stringent standard for our trucks, for our SUVs and our pickups, then heck, let's just go make more of them 
B SUVs and pickups. You know, many of our SUVs are indistinguishable from a car, but they make little changes so that they're classified as trucks, not cars. And the effect of all that was our vehicles are much bigger than any other market in the world. They have become so big that they, they create all kinds of unintended consequences, safety problems, more energy consumed, less amenable to being electrified with batteries. So we have a lot of challenge. In addition to footprint-based regulations, CAFE standards introduced a credit system that allows automakers to earn credits for exceeding fuel efficiency targets. These credits can be banked for future use, traded between manufacturers, or transferred across a company's vehicle fleet. But this has become another way that auto manufacturers have learned to take advantage of the system in ways that the government did not necessarily intend. Both NHTSA and EPA have created programs that allow for the trading of credits between different automakers. Well, where are these legacy companies that build a lot of the internal combustion engine vehicles getting the credits from? Well, they're getting them from Tesla. They're all negotiating individualized agreements with Tesla for the purchase of credits, but the result of all of this regulation is that the cost of producing fleets of new vehicles is just going way up. And statistics show very clearly that new model vehicles are much safer in highway crashes than older cars. And NHTSA actually acknowledged that as a result of these more stringent fuel economy standards, more people will be killed and more people will be seriously injured in highway crashes. And that's because more Americans, particularly lower income Americans, will be stuck driving older and older used cars. We're not in 1975 United States geopolitical world anymore, right? We are a net exporter of oil and gas, and with the fracking revolution in 2008 or so, that's not gonna change anytime soon. We have enormous reserves of energy, so the, the notion that we're kind of need to preserve our in energy independence from Saudi Arabia or something like that, it's not that there's nothing to it, but it's much less urgent than it was back in the 70s. The reason we had CAFE policy in the very beginning is there was a larger public interest that went beyond what an individual consumer would, would choose. And it's not that we want to take away choice. In fact, we want to give more choice, but we want to encourage what's in the public interest. We used to say the bigger vehicles were safer. Now we're coming to appreciate the bigger vehicles are unsafe for the smaller vehicles and the pedestrians. The pedestrian death rate in the U.S. is much higher than in Europe, for instance, even though they have denser cities and more pedestrians. So the question becomes, what's in the public interest? Is it to just let these vehicles keep getting bigger and bigger, which consume more energy, take up more space, cause problems with parking garages, and are less safe? What you really want is a regulatory regime that recognizes the consumer's need for a range of different affordable models that have the power and the capacity and the performance that they need at a price they can afford, because you really want to encourage people to buy new model vehicles. That keeps the economy robust, keeps the automobile uh, industry going, and also they're much more safe. As we look ahead, Balancing motivation, sustainability, and consumer needs and automotive regulation remains a pressing challenge. The Biden administration's ambitious goal to mandate zero emission vehicles by 2035 was supposed to address climate concerns, but it also raised questions about feasibility, affordability, and infrastructure readiness. In contrast, President Trump's recent Unleashing American Energy Executive Order eliminates the electric vehicle mandate entirely promoting consumer choice and reducing regulatory barriers, but also possibly setting back the strides made against climate change in recent decades. About 85% of the supply chain for the raw materials and parts for making the electric vehicle batteries is controlled by China. So not all of it's mined in China, but China's our biggest geopolitical rival. So if a shift away from liquid fuels and oil and gas to electric vehicles uh, puts us in a new vulnerable position in terms of our national security in exactly the opposite way that the CAFE program was designed to accomplish. 
we are moving to vehicle electrification. There's almost zero doubt about that. The industry is committed. It's a question of time, how fast we do it and exactly how we do it. Some of the electric vehicle technology is wonderful, but forcing a rapid conversion to electric vehicles is just completely unrealistic. We don't have the charging infrastructure. Nobody has worked out how the electricity grid will be built out to accommodate that. The price of electricity will go way up. So yes, those issues are very significant. CAFE standards reflect the ongoing tension between innovation and control, safety and freedom. A tension that also drives debates around other emerging car technologies, like AI and driverless vehicles. Understanding these dynamics is key to building a future that balances technological advancement with real-world practicality.